That out. Now welcome back to the second evolutionary video. Right, today we're going to be talking about species and taxonomy, so the way we classify um, species. Now the word species, you might think, is probably one of the most basic key words in biology, right? Surely any biologist in their right mind would be able to answer the question, what is a species, if it ever came up on, you know, if they went on mastermind or something. Well, you are wrong, because the word species is probably one of the most complicated words in the whole of biology. In this video, we're going to be talking about the three main definitions that are out there. Now, there isn't necessarily a right or wrong answer for this, because all of these species concepts have their shortcomings and sort of contradict each other. So, it's a bit of a mess, but let's go through it, shall we? Right, the first one is the biological species concept, and this is probably the one, if you do biology, the one you're most familiar with. It's all to do with reproductive isolation. If two um, species cannot interbreed to give fertile offspring, then they're considered to be good species. They're two distinct species. They're reproductively isolated. And this was proposed by Ernest Mayer in the 1920s, and it probably is the most agreed definition for a species. The fact that two species are unique if they don't hybridise. And it's the definition which is used in the conservation of species. You've heard of the IUCN Red List? That's all about conserving certain species, so it's very important that our definition of a species is correct. And this is the one we use for that. However, it does have some disadvantages. First one being, what if your um, species that you're looking at doesn't reproduce sexually? Obviously, bacteria, archaea, and loads of eukaryotes reproduce asexually. So they physically can't interbreed with anything. So technically, under the biological species concept, whenever an asexual organism divides and reproduces, then the progeny is a different species of the parent. So that doesn't make much sense, does it? And also, it's very difficult for some organisms to test whether they're reproductively isolated because they may live in completely different places, so we don't know whether they're the same species or not. For extinct taxa, there's no way we can bring a dinosaur back to life and get it to have sex with something, so it's very difficult to um, um, use a biological species concept for extinct animals. Also, plants are a bit difficult because in some plant groups they actually hybridise quite regularly. Dandelions, for example, are composed of a whole range of microspecies. It's not just one species. Next concept is the phylogenetic species concept, and this is all based on monophyly. Now you should know, well, if you do biology, what a monophyletic group is. A monophyletic group contains all the known descendants from a single common ancestor. And in terms of the phylogenetic species concept, a species is the smallest diagnosable um, monophyletic group on a phylogenetic tree. So it's basically the tips of the branches, basically. So we're assuming by comparing traits between these two species that they've been isolated long enough to each possess diagnostic traits. Now, of course, this has some downsides. Firstly, we only have phylogenies for a certain amount of species. It also depends on the traits that we're using to build our phylogenetic tree. There are loads of different phylogenetic trees out there, but they're all um, using different traits. So that means the shape and the organisation of the tree will be different. So which one do you choose? It's a bit difficult in that sense. And also, there may be two morphs, if you like, which are the same species under the biological species concept, but genetically different enough to be classified as different species on a phylogenetic tree. So therefore, under the phylogenetic species concept, they're different species. 
So this may result in doubling the amount of species that we actually have. Well, the last species concept is a little bit more straightforward. It's the morpho species concept. And this is basically looking at morphological features um, that we can see, we can physically see it in an organism. And this is particularly useful for paleontologists where the biological species concept and the phylogenetic species concepts don't apply. Um, we can only classify extinct organisms sometimes by just looking at their morphological features. But of course, it also has its downsides. For a start, a species may be polymorphic. That's when the male and female look significantly different from each other. So that may confuse a paleontologist a bit because he may think that the morphological features of the female and the morphological features of the male are quite different. So under the morpho species concept, they're two distinct species when they're not. Also, with very, very small taxa, so your prokaryotes, your bacteria and your archaea, I mean, no disrespect to them, but it's very difficult to um, analyse particular morphological features because they all basically look the same, don't they? So what have we concluded from all this? Well, the conclusion is that it's hard to find a really good definition for a species. Usually, when the biological species concept and the phylogenetic species concept agree, we can be pretty certain that they're two separate species. Now, one of the main molecular techniques that's used today is DNA barcoding. That's taking a particular sequence of DNA which, within a species, doesn't change very much. But between species um, does have distinct changes. Um, this is usually in mitochondrial DNA. This is particularly useful when finding cryptic species. What are cryptic species? Well, a cryptic species is a set of species which, morphologically, they look pretty much exactly the same. But actually, after some DNA barcoding analysis, are actually two separate species. And we'll come on to a prime example of this later on in the video. Now, there are two case studies I'd like to go through to demonstrate what I'm talking about. The first being the one of the red wolf. Right, the red wolf. Beautiful creature found in North America and in the 1970s we underwent a massive decline. Ah, oh, but not to worry, 14 um, individuals were taken for captive breeding so they could be successfully bred and increase the population size when they were reintroduced into the wild. So we used to think that the red wolf was just a normal, standard, beautiful species roaming around woods in North America. After 1930s, after studying the skulls of these wolves, we found that certain um, aspects of them looked very much like the coyote skull. So then scientists began to think, well, red wolves are in decline, maybe they're having so much trouble finding mates that they've started hybridising with coyotes, which also live in um, the area which the red wolves live. So that's possible. However, after extensive mitochondrial DNA analysis, um, scientists concluded that red wolves were actually hybrids of coyotes and grey wolves. And grey wolves also live in the same area. So that means the red wolf on its own isn't a species under the biological species concept. It's not under the phylogenetic species concept. So. It's not a true species, and this raises massive controversy on whether we should um, increase efforts into conserving the species, because it's not technically a species, so what do we do? Do we just let it die, or do we not? Post what you think below. And the second case study I'd like to go on to are pipistrel bats. Now, pipistrel bats are the most abundant bats in Europe, and were once considered to be only one species, and that is before Bristol's very own Gareth Jones came along and smashed that idea all to pieces. Yeah, go on, Gareth. Okay, in 1993, Gareth found out that the pipistrelle bats um, were of two different phonic types. Ones which called at 45 kilohertz and ones which called at 55 kilohertz. And these two phonic types seem to um, occur in the same geographical range. Now there's been a lot of debate on what these two different phonic types, the 45 and the 55 kilohertz, are actually used for. What Gareth did was he played a 55 kilohertz sound 
to um, where he knew there was a 55 kilohertz colony of bats. And he counted the amount of bats in the area whilst he was playing the sound. And he found out that there were actually less bats than there would be if there was no sound playing. This made Gareth think that these sounds weren't being produced for display or mating. Because if they were, then surely more bats would be attracted into the area that Gareth was recording in, um, in the hope of finding a mate. So what those scientists actually concluded was that these calls were used in food defence, because these social calls were being used more often when the bats were chasing other bats um, to get them off their patch, basically. Chase them off so they can all have all the beetles, moths, stuff that were flying around all to themselves. What Gareth also did is that he introduced the 55 kilohertz call to a 45 kilohertz phonotype bat. And what he found out there was nothing at all. So the 45 kilohertz bats didn't respond to the 55 kilohertz um, calls whatsoever. So this further backed up the idea that these were distinct species. Now also what Gareth found was that within mating colonies of these bats, they were all of the same phonic type, so either 45 or 55 kilohertz. So that even further suggests that there's reproductive isolation going on here between the two phonic types. And this makes sense really for an animal which is nocturnal and doesn't really rely on its sight whatsoever. So it doesn't really matter if these two species look the same at all because that vision is not their primary um, sense. They mostly detect the world around them by sound signals. So it's the acoustics, difference in acoustics between these two species that are more important than any morphological differences. Now, after looking at the skulls of these species, there is some differences, but there is a lot of overlap. So these two species basically look exactly the same. Now, after analysis of the cytochrome B gene in these bats, what actually happened was that this pipistrelle bat was separated into four separate clades. Two of the 45 kilohertz and two of the 55 kilohertz. So four different species were produced from what we originally thought was one species. And what's even more amazing is that genetic differences between one of the cryptic species and a non-cryptic species, so one which does look morphologically different from the pipistrelle bat, the genetic differences between them is less than between the cryptic species. So that just puts the icing on the cake, really. They are different species, these bats. It's thought that these cryptic species evolved through allopatric speciation. Now, once again, we'll talk all about that in the next video. And when, after further study, they actually found that these two different phonic types do actually live in quite slightly different environments in um, the ecosystem. Okay, that's the two case studies I'd like to go into. Now, to name a new species, there are certain rules you have to go under. Well, we all know that every species has a binomial name. It starts with the genus and then the species. Now, you can't actually name a species after yourself, which is a bit annoying. But what scientists tend to do is that they name species after their colleagues, not because they really like them a lot, but hopefully that they'll reciprocate one day with a species named after them. <laughs> That's how science works, I'm afraid. And usually when it comes to publishing, when you name a species, it always contains the person who named that species in brackets after it. If you just see an L, that's because it was Linnaeus, and he was um, the one that invented this binomial nomenclature. So he's just awesome, he just needs an L. You don't need to write his full name. So to name a species, you must consult the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature. You've also got to have a sample specimen, so say you're in the middle of the jungle and you think you've found a new species, I'm afraid you're going to have to kill it because you need a specimen to take back to put in a museum collection. So, it must have authorship, you must have a choice specimen, you can't name it after yourself. There are a whole load of rules you have to go into when naming species. And that's basically all I'd like to go into today. Well, thank you very much. We'll talk about speciation. Um, tomorrow, how new species are created. Actually, no, it won't be tomorrow. No.
having a nice relaxing day tomorrow actually it's going to be oh it's going to be lovely